me start with a question, and it's a very important question, and then I'm going to finish with a challenge. The question is, can we save millions of lives every year by controlling a disease which is very simple to control? Now, I'm not talking about the big blockbuster infectious diseases that we all know. They're the, the diseases such as malaria, such as HIV AIDS, and such as tuberculosis. No, I'm not talking about those. I'm talking about vitamin A deficiency. It's not a disease that people think of as a world killer, but it is. Every year, somewhere between 1.9 and 2.8 million people die from vitamin A deficiency. And that's not counting all of the kids that go permanently blind, all of the, uh, all of the intellectual development um, reductions, all of the immune deficiency reductions as well. It's huge outcomes from this particular disease. Now, the strange thing is that it's very, very localised. Vitamin A deficiency is almost reduced down to sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. Bits and pieces elsewhere. So those countries in red are where more than 15% of the population have clinical vitamin A deficiency. The interesting thing here is that HIV AIDS, there's no, there's no vaccine. There is no vaccine for malaria. The vaccine for tuberculosis is pretty ordinary. So we can understand why there are so many people that die of those diseases every year. Not so vitamin A deficiency. We know exactly what causes it, and we know exactly how to prevent it, and we know exactly how to cure it. But why aren't we? Well, in fact, we're doing a huge amount. There have been a number of very, very good strategies over the years, particularly uh, food supplements and food fortification. So supplements, um, uh, pills that are, are provided with, with vitamin A that can last for very, a, a number of months. Food fortification, we can add vitamin A to oil, we can add vitamin A to a whole lot of food. But they miss a whole population, a whole resistant population, and that's the population that are poorest of the poor. These are the subsistence farming populations. They don't buy food, they produce their own food. And they're too far from health clinics to get a supplement. And even if they, they were able to get to that health clinic, they don't have the money to pay for it. So while those strategies are absolutely fabulous and have been wonderful over many, many years, they're quite expensive to run, but we still have this resistant population. There has been the strategy of getting these uh, uh, subsistence farming populations to change crops. It's been a complete disaster. And the reason for that is subsistence farmers are very conservative. They normally have a small plot of land. They know how to grow their staple crops. They're not going to change. It is too big a risk. If they don't get their crop in that year, if they don't get their harvest, they die. So they won't change their crops. So more recently has been this idea of biofortifying staple crops. So this is taking the food that people eat and add those micronutrients to it. This is an important development. We can do it two ways. We can do it either by conventional breeding, and that's been very successful for a number of crops, particularly things like uh, sweet potatoes. But where those genes aren't available within that staple crop to be, to be made into pro-vitamin A, I'll talk about that in a moment, we need to use another methodology. And the methodology that we use for bananas is uh, by genetic modification. OK, these are the staple crops of the world. Most of them you would recognise. The top four, of course, corn, rice, wheat, potatoes, everybody knows them. Those. Once you get down a bit, we start to say, oh, I'm not sure what cassava is. I don't think I've ever seen that in the market. And yeah, yams, uh, maybe I'd identify them. Um, sorghum, no, I've never had sorghum as a, as a staple. And bananas, they're a dessert crop. We send those off to, the, to, the, with, to school with the kids in the morning. That's not a dessert crop. Yes, it is. We have this Western idea of what a banana is, and that's a dessert crop. In fact, it's a fabulous source of starch. And in many countries of this world, in the wet tropics and the wet subtropics, bananas are a staple food. These are the countries that grow bananas. The, the highest uh, consumption, uh, or highest production is in India, 26 million tonnes a year, with a little over a billion people. Second highest production is Uganda, 33 million people. Huge difference, but they only produce nearly twice as much bananas in India. So in Uganda, you'd say, they obviously eat a lot of bananas. They do. Average consumption, around about a half a kilo per person per day, and that's from everybody from a, 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 a naught-year-old to an old person. So you can understand that in that middle range, the adults eat in excess of one kilo per person per day. This is their staple food. This is their form of starch. And there are many other countries in that, in that same level, places like Rwanda, Burundi, uh, Tanzania, Kenya to a lesser extent, Democratic Republic of Congo, and when we go over to West Africa, it's the plantains. 
but I'm going to talk particularly about Uganda. And I've come here just to slide, just to give you some sense of what that banana culture is like. So this you see all over Uganda. It's everywhere, and it's also in all of those surrounding countries in the Great Lakes region as well. The slide with those guys on their, on their push bikes, pushing three bunches of bananas, I often say they've just been to the supermarket for buying the weekly groceries. That's about as much of, uh, of bananas that one family would eat every week. So, significant amounts. Okay, so just, just a couple of uh, scientific things here. We're not putting vitamin A into these bananas, we're putting pro-vitamin A into these bananas. The reason is vitamin A in very high levels can be toxic. Pro-vitamin A is actually alpha and beta carotene. Uh, it is non-toxic. You can have massive amounts. You might go slightly orange if you have huge amounts, but that's the only <laughs> outcome. And that's to remind you that these are actually orange, these alpha and beta carotene. There are bananas in the world with very, very high levels of beta-carotene and alpha-carotene. And there is one up in Papua New Guinea called Asapina. And we were able to access that banana. We wanted to know why it was so high, whereas things like Cavendish, you'll see there the number 137 over on the right-hand side. Cavendish has 1.7, so way, way down. 137 down to 1.7. So what we've done is we've worked out how much of this beta-carotene we have to put into the bananas, particularly in Africa, and now more recently in India and we've come up with a magic number of 20 micrograms per gram. But just remember the number 20. That's the threshold where we can start to make a very, very significant difference. And what we've done is we've taken a single gene from that banana from Papua New Guinea, that asapina, and we've moved it across into Cavendish bananas and into the bananas in Africa, the East African Highland bananas. They're the cooking bananas. And this is our field trial. This is the first field trial of genetically modified bananas in Australia. It was about a fourth in the world. You might notice they look pretty normal, and they do. They look exactly the same as any other banana. Even though we've moved a gene, they look exactly the same. Until, of course, you open up the fruit. When you open up our best one, the flesh inside is orange. These bananas contain 55 micrograms per gram. So our target was 20. We're nearly threefold over target. Our idea initially was to replace 50% or provide 50% of the recommended daily allowance. We can now look at providing 100% using just this very, very simple technology. But very importantly, what we're doing in Australia is we develop the technology, but not the plants. That's what happens in Uganda. We've got collaborators over there, fabulous collaborators, and they're doing the genetic modification of their bananas. So the whole concept here is Ugandan bananas made by Ugandans for Ugandans. We're now into field trials. We're now into field trials in Uganda. And the big thing is the question, can we save millions of lives? from a simple controllable disease? Yes, we can. Technically, we can. We can do that. We've now developed the technology. We have a target date of 2020 to release these bananas in Uganda and then in surrounding countries. Our target population for these bananas is 125 million people. But there's a challenge because there are people in this world who have real concerns about genetic modification for whatever reason, for whatever crop. So what I put up here is to try to take on what the major concerns are and then talk about what we've done in our bananas. For instance, there's a concern of unknown consequences of using foreign genes. This isn't a foreign gene. It comes out of a banana. It's a banana gene. <laughs> <coughs> there's a concern about new traits that haven't pre previously be con been consumed. Well, two things here. One is, every day we eat plants that have beta-carotene in them. Every single plant has some level of beta-carotene. The asapina banana, where we took our, we took our gene, it has beta-carotene in it. So this isn't, a, this isn't a, a, a compound that hasn't been eaten for thousands of years. In fact, we need it. So all other plants, all of our, nearly all of our food contains beta-carotene. Genes moving into non-GM crops, this whole idea of what, what called, what's called transgene flow, sometimes referred to as genetic pollution. Our bananas are essentially sterile. They won't move. These genes cannot move. Sometimes, you know, when you cut a banana down the middle, you'll see those little black specks. They're the aborted seeds. These bananas don't produce seed, and the pollen is sterile. Then there is the old one of control by multinationals, this idea of control of genetic resources. 
First thing is there aren't any multinationals involved in our project at all. It's funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. It's a philanthropic project and the idea is to release these bananas at below cost as soon as they're ready. There aren't any patents, there won't be any profit made out of this project at all. And finally, most of the GM crops in the world today produce benefits, you know, whether it's insect resistance or, or herbicide tolerance, whatever. These bananas are for the consumer. And that is, the consumer is the poorest of the poor in this world. So the challenge is, do we abandon these people, these poorest of the poor, because there are some people in this world who don't want to let these products go ahead? Thank you. Thank you.